has come and gone. Did you get any good Valentines? That's the question. Anybody? I bet you did not get one of these. Real Valentines. Honest Valentines. To the most amazingly beautiful, unbelievable, attractive woman in the world that I could get for right now. <laughs> Happy Valentine's Day. Or, hey sweetie, I'm too lazy and or cheap to go out and buy you actual things, so here's some love coupons. Didn't cost a cent, but I love you. Or my favorite, in a sultry Latin accent, My darling, if you will marry me, I promise to cherish your citizenship like it's my very own. <laughs> Real Valentines! I didn't make these up. Real ones. I wonder if our world isn't a little bit messed up when it comes to understanding the word love. The message that I would share this morning, I want to bring from a passage that's very familiar to most of us. The 1 Corinthians chapter 13 passage where Paul begins to talk about love. And what I'm probably going to do is stray from my normal sermon style. Uh, rather than make three or four points, I just want to walk us through. Uh, walk us through this chapter and make a few observations along the way. And as we do that, the first thing that we've got to do is to sort of establish the context for this 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It's not stuck right here where it is so that it sounds good at your wedding. It's not put here so that it looks great on that super spiritual card that you want to give your loved one. Chapter 13 is precisely where it is for a reason. It's stuck right in between chapter 12 Bronson and chapter 14, right. With a little help, you got it. <laughs> chapter 12, on the front end of this text, we find that Paul is talking about uh, the endowment of spiritual gifts. He talks about the distribution of the gifts of God. And to some He gives wisdom, to some He gives prophecy or faith or healing or miraculous powers, and, and we've heard the list before. And just like the human body is made up of many parts, the body of Christ is made up of many parts. Each part has its function. That's on the front. Now move to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. At the back end of our text, we find Paul discussing the function of the spiritual gifts of God. He uses prophecy in tongues specifically to illustrate the purpose of the gifts and their benefit that they have to the church. Again, we've got, we've got the functions of the church. And the functions of the church. And then in the middle, we have this oh-so-romantic passage about love. Sounds nice at weddings, but I don't believe what the Apostle Paul is doing is talking about, about marital love. I don't believe that he's... Uh, in, the, in between these two bookends of, of the church body and the church function, that he just, ooh, let me tell you about love. Chapter 13 begins, And now I will show you the most excellent way. There's nothing higher or better than what I'm about to share. For the functioning church, for the body of Christ, for the people of God, this is the most important stuff we need to know. Now here's what's going on in the Corinthian church. The Corinthian church is a very important place. In its day, it was located in Corinth, obviously. And, and Corinth was the social and, and cultural center of the world. People from all over came through the city. The church in Corinth had a fairly decent ministry in their community. All of the spiritual gifts seemed to be in place. The right doctrine was being preached, and not only preached, but it was being learned. 
But there was something missing in the Corinthian church. The church was, was struggling to stay afloat. There were lots of little quarrels taking place, and, and you can read about them as you read through this letter that Paul sends. There's self-centeredness seems to be a, a prominent trait of those in the church. Jealousy was very much alive. The church was moving along, but, but they weren't really going anywhere. They weren't exploding like uh, all the indicators said they should be. Paul's message to the church is very clear. You can have all the gifts of God. You can have all of the, the, the right qualities of God present in your church. You can know and believe and quote all of the right things. You can have the right doctrine and the right theology. You can have the indwelling of the Spirit and all of the spiritual gifts in place. But everything you do, he says, is empty and meaningless and void of God's Spirit if you don't have love. And now I will show you the most excellent way. If I speak in tongues of men and of angels, but I have not love, I'm a noisy gong or clanging cymbal. <coughs> whether I speak in tongues, whether I use the very language of the angels, whether I'm the smoothest talker in town and can woo a crowd in a matter of minutes, without love, everything that I say will be as annoying as a little kid playing the drums in the living room while Jethro Gibbs is on the big screen. Without love, my mouth has the inability to do anything good whatsoever. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have and deliver my body up to be burned, but I have not love, I gain nothing. Paul says if I can tell the future, solve every problem, know all that there is to be known, without love it's pointless. If I have faith that can move a mountain any time, any place, if I give everything that I've got to the poor of the world, even if I'm martyred for the cause of Christ, without love I am nothing. If I can lead a thousand people to Christ today, and pay off the dead, or, or, or build a new church, or, or meet every need in town, without love at the core of who I am, it's all pointless. It's at this point that Paul begins to share with his audience what he understands real love to be. It's not his opinion that he shares. It's not stuff that he thinks that will sound good when, when we do weddings 2,000 years into the future. Paul's understanding of real love comes from receiving firsthand from God. God, who is the very essence of love itself. The love that we show to others, Paul says, ought to be reflective of these qualities. And the love that we show towards our God ought to be made up of these qualities. Love is patient. Anybody out already? First one on the list and I'm done. Love is patient. It waits. It's not in a hurry. It waits for whoever you're loving to get the memo and be brought up to speed. Love is kind. Love treats others good. Decent. Love is not envious. Real love celebrates the victories of others. It's not boastful and not proud. Real love is not about what we can do. It's about how we can equip others to do their very best. It's not rude. In the body of Christ, rudeness has no place whatsoever. 
Not directed towards one another. Not directed towards anyone else. It is not selfish. It's not my way or the highway. Unless it's at home. Then it's my way. Real love is not easily angered. We've got to learn to stop taking every little thing so personal. Real love doesn't keep score. Kind of like upwards. We don't keep score, not with the rights that we do or the wrongs that others do towards us. It doesn't delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It creates an environment where real love creates an environment where truth is honored, not deception. It always protects. It always hopes. It always perseveres or endures. Verse 8, love never fails. Prophecies, they will pass away. Tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away as well. But love never fails. Love is a permanent and perpetual grace. There's coming a time when tongues will, will cease for the language of heaven will be clear for each of its inhabitants to understand. Prophecies will cease because the consummation of all of the histories of the world will have taken place. Knowledge will cease for we will stand in the light of the truth of God and we will be known, we will know just as fully as we're known. But love, it never fails. Love will continue. Love's the only thing that we'll take with us to the grave. Verse 9, For we know in part and we prophesy in part. Have you ever stopped to think how little we know of God? How little of a portion the authors of Scripture knew of God. How, how little that the prophets of old knew of God. I mean, the Word is all we've got to go by. But in comparison to God Himself how little we actually have of God. We know in part. But one day we will stand before Him and we will fully know, just as He does. When the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up my childish ways. Or at least that's the plan. (laughs) For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. When perfection comes, when Jesus returns, all the imperfections of this life will pass away and we will be made new, perfect, just as God intended from the start. And we shall know God just as fully as He knows us. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. When all things are made new, when we are standing in the presence of the Heavenly Father, when we look upon Him just as He looks upon us, we'll no longer need to walk by faith. Because then we can walk by sight and it will be A-OK. We'll no longer need to, to live with hope. For that which we have hoped for our entire existence will be our current reality. Only love translates into the eternity of God. Faith, hope, and love abide these three. But the greatest of these is love. And now I will show you the church. 
the most excellent way. Now I show you the church how to treat one another. Now I show you the church how to treat the world. Today we walk through one of probably the most powerful passages in all of the Scripture and we barely, barely got below the surface. But this is the very core of the nature of God and it's what His desire is for us, His people. And so, I have a number of questions that I'd like you to consider as we come to a close today. In your personal life, are you following a biblical model of love? In your family circumstances, are you following a biblical model of love? In your church relations, are you following a biblical model of love? As you look at what God declares love is, are your motives called into question? Is there anyone in your life that you cannot love? You should look around the room here this morning. Is there anyone in your church that you cannot love? Hmm. Whether they deserve it or not isn't the question. Whether they want it or not isn't the question. Whether even they receive it or not. What's at stake is your willingness to respond to others the way God has declared each of us to treat folks. It doesn't matter what we do in life. It doesn't matter what we do at home. It doesn't matter what we do here. If we don't love people the way God intends for us to do that, how's your love? It's Valentine's weekend. It's a good time to stop and think about it. May we pray. Father, today as we close, may this be one of those times in our lives where we are challenged by what we think about ourselves. God, maybe today it's not about who all else needed to hear this, uh, this understanding of Your Word. Today it's about us and how we need to hear it and how we need to respond to it. Do we love like you love. Father, Your Word says that what You do is love us. And that what You expect from us is that we love others the same way. Your love was not cautious, but extravagant. Help us, God, to learn to become people who love others extravagantly. Not because they deserve it or earn it or uh, any of that. But simply because it shows the world what You look like more clearly. God, use us to love. This is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen.